President Clark, soon to be President Warshower, Justice Sharon Lee of the Tennessee Supreme Court, and I should tell you when recognizing Justice Lee that she made the majority of, of the Tennessee Supreme Court female when she ascended to that uh, august position. And you'll hear probably a little bit more about her in a little while. But uh, Angela Spear and the Georgia Watch team, y'all are just so appreciated and so important for everything we do to help everybody. And I'll say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but really let me say, and family members, because that is truly what we have kind of started as, and my job is a history, and where we have found ourselves today. Uh, I feel a closeness and a dynamic in this organization today that I have not felt probably in 30 years. Uh, and I think when the bear is at the door, the family circles up. And I think that's part of it. And uh, you hear all these pleas all the time. And if, if, you, if you think the need for your money or the pleas to get some more of your money will ever cease, it will not. And I think that I should probably talk to a few of y'all, not all of you, but a few of you, and say, yeah, you can let a small number of people carry the big water. You can do that if that's what you can sleep with. But what you're able to do for your clients tomorrow has to do with what people are giving and doing today. And everybody is needed. Just like if we were sitting around a family table and somebody wasn't bringing their share of the groceries, you just have to speak to them and say you're not bringing your share of the groceries, but you'll all be welcome, always be welcome at the table. You know, but just think about it. And just think about it. It's not an easy concept, and Michael screamed at you a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes we need a little screaming. And uh, I had a first draft of my history of GTLA that some of you in the room will be pleased to know that I threw away. And uh, Jeff Kaufman, I ran it by him, and he said, Tommy, you know, really, you don't need to get into all those details. And he's right, and it's because of this feeling of family that we have here today. The feeling of family. And we, we all have a common enemy. And, it, and if you who don't do anything but truck wreck cases think that gross negligence standard across the board in medical negligence cases won't one day find its way to trucking, you know, you, you're just living in a vacuum. You're living in a dream, a dream that maybe uh, this history may uh, have some bearing, you know, to uh, have some meaning for you. You might not know that this organization began in 1955, 55 years ago. 1955, and it was organized as the Georgia NACA, National Association of Claimants Compensation Attorneys of America. That was the founding of ATLA, now AAJ. Uh, and the first president in Georgia in 1955 was Roscoe Pickett, who significantly, or not to the political leaders, was the only Republican I ever knew. But he was the first president <laughs> of this organization. And I'm talking about I only knew back in those days, you know, days when I came along. 1956, the first issue of the verdict had Judge Anthea Alamo, who's gone on to greater rewards, but who we honored so well and appreciated so much, was our, was our first editor of the verdict. And, and as I go through these things, just think about how this organization and this fellowship touched so many people and is touching you now. And the, and the viability of this organization and the camaraderie, the fellowship, is, is so important. In 1950, 1957, the very first seminar occurred. Wasn't very many people there, I don't think. But in 1958, they decided to rename NACA to the Georgia Association of Plaintiff's Trial Attorneys. And when I first became a member, after some degree of struggle to get in, uh, I always wondered, GAPTA? GAPTA? Who in the world thought of that? I think Hugh Head was the one that named us GAPTA. But in 1959, the lobbying efforts of GAPTA resulted in demonstrative evidence being used in the courtroom. And a per diem argument was permissible when seeking to get adequate damages. Now this will get you. In 1961, the regular dues were raised from $5 to $10. 
from five dollars to ten dollars in 1961. Yapta, member Carl Sanders in 1963, was elected governor of the state of Georgia. And we've had another member that was governor, and I hope we have him back again before long. Uh, I graduated from law school in 1966 and attended my first gap to seminar probably in 1967. And it was here in Atlanta, and at that time there were about 100 members of the organization. And I came to a seminar, a much smaller room than this, but it was a good crowd. And there wasn't any mandatory CLE in those days, but we were teaching each other. And I, and I was down in Albany and I came up to Atlanta. It was quite a trip in those days. I had to save up to get here. Uh, by the way, I drew $350 a month when I first started practicing law, Adam, and uh, $350 a month. <laughs> but I can tell you that uh, I bought my car, my second car down in Albany, and I bought a car for $350 too. So uh, things um, are historical and put them in perspective. Uh, I heard a speaker talk about how when there was a rear end wreck, that you could go get the light bulb out of the back of the car, and I think maybe it had to happen at night then, I don't know if it had brake lights, but anyway, it was something about bulbs. You know, and if you got that bulb and you opened it and you looked at it, and there was carbon on the filament where the bulb was lit up, that meant, and the, uh, the deformation by the, uh, that by the heat, it meant the light was on at the time of impact when the bulb was burst. Well, think about, man, that was something back then. You know, all y'all know that now, but uh, I said that and many other things. I particularly remember that. And I remember I met uh, Dr. Albert uh, Clark, who was the first economist I ever met. I guarantee you I'm the first lawyer you ever had an economist come to Albany, Georgia and testify. But, I mean, these things, you know, you don't learn in law school and you don't think about. But I said, man, I want to get with that group. They, they, they got what I want to learn. My father at the same time was telling me I was crazy as hell if I could make, I thought I could make a living practicing personal injury law. And he would have been right if times hadn't changed, as you'll see in a moment. But uh, I, I recognize John James. He was a senior uh, uh, member of the Mercer uh, Law School when I was a, a freshman, so he was a year or two ahead of me when I was a first year. And I called John and I said, John, you know, I saw you at that seminar in Atlanta, and man, I, I, want, to, I want to become a member of that uh, GAPTA organization. He said, well, Tommy, I don't know. You know, it's pretty restrictive, you know, and uh, I'll do what I can. And I had to call him the next year. I had to stay after him to be able to pay my $10, you know, and become a member of GAPTA. But fortunately, I was persistent and I got in. And uh, there may be stories people can think about why it was so hard to get in and why some people wanted to, wanted to, say, to say small. The largest verdict in 1970 in the state of Georgia, the history of the state of Georgia was $425,000. And that's not very different from what Mel Belli published in the Adequate Award in 1954, that 250000 was the largest verdict or award anywhere in the country. So they had made some progress, or just inflation had taken its toll by then. Judge Randall Evans, Jr., who could have been president every year that he wanted to be here, be president, uh, became the first life member. Judge Alamo was the second life member. Knowing them as I do, I am sure that they did not pay the $5,000 to become life member and they were truly honorary life members. And I probably need to ask these presidents or ask Lynn Colston, uh, how many life members we got today? Uh, or what is the effect of life membership? Well, when we paid the $5,000, to GTLA, we wasn't ever going to have to pay admission to seminars, and we wouldn't ever have to pay dues again. And I paid the 5000 to ATLA at the time, and we wasn't going to have to do that. But you can't find a life member around ATLA. We call ourselves Leaders Forum now, or President's Club, because a life member see already paid. But you don't get mad about things like that. I, I guess somebody might want to file a lawsuit and say that, you know, we... <laughs> We had a contract, you know, we wouldn't have to pay these things anymore, you know, and legally we'd be right. But uh, you just keep giving and the giving never stops. If, uh, you know, I, I, like, like my income tax one time, I said, boy, when somebody pays that number, you just ought not to ever have to pay anymore. You know, that that's your fair share. 
and I feel that way about uh, the Georgia trial lawyers too. You know, you, you, some people think, well, boy, I gave to this and I gave to that and I gave to that and they still want some more. Let me tell you, they ain't ever stopping. And as long as you're doing good, look, look, look like my accountant told me. Don't think about how much they take from you. Think about what you got left. And in this organization, think about what you're able to do to feel so good about what you do every day. Th think about that. And, and that's why we continue to give back. Now, things were a little testy in the early 70s. And I met Melvin Belli, and you all have heard the story about how Belli impacted my life. But, and all these other historical figures with GTLA had an influence on my life, like the family that we really are. But I asked a gentleman who was uh, president of Atla at the time, or about to be president, who knew more about railroad crossing cases. Now, Bush et al. have pre just about preempted us out of railroad crossing cases, but maybe there's hope with uh, groups like Georgia Watch and others uh, to get things back where people that are run over by trains, you know, have, have a chance. But the guy that knew more about railroad crossing cases than anybody in the country was a gentleman named J.D. Lee. And J.D. Lee, I should tell you, was not only president of ATLA, but he's been president of the Trial Lawyers for Public Justice, the president of the National Board of Trial Advocacy, the president of the Tennessee Constitutional Convention, president of the Tennessee Trial Lawyers Association, and about seven or eight more presidents that I could, could list presidencies that he held. But he came down to Savannah, Georgia, flew his own Beechcraft Baron down there, and we met him, and uh, Mel Belli took a liking to me and had me speaking at the Belli Seminar, and I was remembered all over the country. And people would come up to me and say, you know, I've never heard anybody talk about a case they lost before. And so I distinguished myself you know, around the country for being somebody that was telling this group about a case they lost. But that case led to me associating Bell I that got us into the drug products case that John Bell, when he was a clerk uh, with Judge Will Bowens, uh, was down there. John, I'll have to, have to take a moment and say, we knew we were in pretty good uh, straits when um, they brought in the medical director who was sitting there before Judge Owens as the corporate representative. And Mel and I were over here with our little paralyzed girl, and Judge Owens comes in, and Mel would every morning get up and say, good morning, Your Honor, and before it was over with, the judge would come in, and he'd say, good morning, Mr. Belli, and everyone else, you know, and uh, that, was, that was pretty good. But the judge said, before anybody made a motion or anything, he said, Mr. Rents, who is that sitting at the table with you? He said, Your Honor, this is uh, Dr. Arthur Smouter. Dr. Ar Dr. Smouter is the medical director of uh, Pharmacia Laboratories. He said, well, is he an officer? He said, no, he's not an officer. Well, he's a, a director on the board. You know, what, what, what does he do? Oh, he's the medical director. He, he, he said, is he going to testify in this case? He said, yes, he plans to be the primary witness for the corporate defendant. He said, well, he can step outside, you know, with the other witnesses. You can get some president or some officer to come in here and sit with you. So Mr. Rents sat lonely at that table for the first entire day and maybe a part of the, a part of the next day. And uh, justice was later served in that case. But let me return uh, to J.D. Lee. At that time, we had $10 dues. And at that time... We had no executive secretary. The, the office of the GTLA, GAPTA, if you will, would move from president to president. And I submit to you, if you don't have an executive director, your organization will be no stronger than the current president, or maybe a president-elect who's pushing mighty hard. But that's no way to um, have an organization that could one day uh, fulminate and become the organization that we have today. So I asked J.D. to come down. I got on that thing about Belli because Belli let everybody know that I was his friend. So then these powerful lawyers from Georgia who was controlling the Georgia Trial Lawyers Association, they wanted to be a friend of Mel's, and Mel let it be known that, well, you better be nice to Tommy. I don't know what happened in the back room, but before you know it, I was chairman of the seminar, and I was kind of a favorite, you know, of the uh, older lawyers. Uh, I don't know how much of a favorite, but a, but a favorite. And as seminar chair, I was able to invite J.D. Lee to come down and talk about railroad crossing cases. Well, he came down, 
and he talked about anything but railroad crossing cases. He talked about how we had an obligation as trial lawyers of the state of Georgia to organize and to become something meaningful rather than just a club of friends, you know, that would sit around and have a good time with each other, that we really had an obligation to the people of this state to raise our dues. I believe I've talked to Eddie Garland to get reminded yesterday, and I think it was $100. Now, to go from 10 to 100, that was a first stretch, you know, for the 100 people, you know, that had been controlling the organization, the club, if you will, for all these years. And that we needed to, first of all, raise those dues, and then we needed to, uh, to get us an executive director. Well, you talk about getting something stirred up. J.D., you don't know because you left. But <laughs> the next year, Eddie Garland, I called him and talked to him about it, and he remembers, because I remember, that we had one big lawyer. He was this tall, I guess, and uh, booming voice, and one of the leaders of the organization. He was adamantly opposed adamantly opposed to increasing the dues and having an executive director. And I thought he and Eddie were going to start fighting each other. Y'all know Big Eddie. And, uh, and, and, and it was that kind of thing. That was probably the first real division that I saw within the organization. But we would still be there if it were not for some champions, the, the, the leader of whom was J.D. Lee. Now let me tell you, J.D., I'm going to recognize you about now but I want to present to you the GTLA Magnificent Motivator Award. The Magnificent Motivator Award presented to J.D. Lee in honor, recognition, and appreciation of your inspiration and leadership, which led to the expansion and strengthening of the Georgia Trial Lawyers Association. Your guidance and influence have forever changed and benefited the lives of trial lawyers and untold number of citizens of the state of Georgia. This recognition is pre presented in grateful acknowledgement of your profound impact upon the distinguished heritage of the Georgia Trial Lawyers Association. And you may say a few words if you want to come up and accept this. <laughs> they, they got steps down here, baby. There's steps down here. Thank you very much, Tommy, my friend of long standing. It is so nice that you're still around after 38 years ago or so <laughs> to remember this. And, and when he called me and asked me to come down for this, he had an award for me. I, I was very much taken aback. I do remember that talk. I remember that, that uh, I had a paper on railroad crossing cases. I gave it out and got rid of it behind me. And then that's what we talked about, just what he's saying here. And so, Seeing this crowd and knowing what you've done, Tommy, uh, this is, makes it all worthwhile. So thank you so much for this, and thank you for the board that voted such a thing as this, and thank you, Justice Lee, for <coughs> a few of your speakers, I'm not a speaker, so I'm getting off, a few of your speakers get driven down by a justice of your Supreme Court, <laughs> but she wanted me to get here, so, <laughs> so here we are. <clears throat> Not too long ago, I called her. I said, Sharon, I need your help. I said, what's that? I said, well, I was coming back from federal court in Chattanooga, and I rear-ended a tractor trailer. I don't know how fast he was going, but my airbag didn't go off, so I was going, well, I had my cruise control on 84, so I was going about 84. <laughs> <Get this. laughs> tractor trailer was going probably 70 miles an hour. So, so anyhow, she helped me get here, and thank you again so much, Sharon, for sharing this with us. And thank all of you for being here. And Tommy, again, thank you, friend, for, uh, for this. Thank you. Time didn't permit J.D. to finish that story, but I'm sure one of the bottom lines is only a few lawyers in Tennessee can get a Supreme Court justice to fix a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in 1973, we uh, had by that time raised our dues in keeping with J.D.'s uh, instructions, and they got a permanent telephone number and address, 
and we got our first executive director, Bob White, who served the association for 16 years. In 1974, from 100 members, in 72, we had grown to 500 members. 500 members. And back in those days, you could not get a lawyer to give $25 to a political candidate. Oh, for those days. $25 because the position was, well, the legislators, they go to Atlanta to represent the people. That's what they do. And probably up until about the early 70s, they had done a pretty good job of doing that. For some reason, we don't have many lawyers in the legislature anymore. That may be selfishness on our part. We're so busy or don't care. Uh, any of you who are out there and consider running for the legislature, I assure you, you will get great help from this organization and others if you take it on. But we just frankly don't have many lawyers who are serving in the legislature anymore. Um, by 76, oh, I need to tell you this. Mel Belli told me in 1972, he said, Tommy, you better enjoy what you're doing while you can because it won't be around 10 years from now. And he saw it. They had MICRA passed out in California that still sets a $250,000 cap. Hadn't even been adjusted for inflation. They've got such restrictive caps on attorney's fees. It's like 40% of the first $250,000, a third up to $500,000, and then it gets down to 10%. And my friend Randy Scarlett, who's asked me to come out and try these couple of cases that y'all know about, has asked me to be involved in 100 medical negligence cases. And I tell him always, Randy, there ain't enough money for you, much less you and me, you know, to handle any med medical negligence case out there. And I think all the good lawyers that handle them do it on a pro bono basis in part. They make a little money, but you, you can't spend hundreds of thousands of dollars expecting to make a couple of hundred thousand dollars. And the tort reformers know that. You know, they're, they're not interested in protecting the people against the greedy lawyers. But you know what I'm scared of? It might cost us $2 million worth of advertising to convince the ordinary citizens in Georgia who vote that they're really after them, they're not really after us. Because everybody in this room could probably represent a roofer against a general contractor or the other way around. There'll be plenty of things for good lawyers to do. I told Hunter Allen back in the 80s, I think, when tort reform was percolating, he was so scared about what was going to happen to his practice because he primarily is, well, y'all know defense and primarily Emily. I said, Hunter, you know, it ain't you and me that need to worry. It's those guys that represent these corporations against one another. Because good lawyers will always be able to find something to do. But I'm going to try and um, keep to my allotted, allotted time. And I'm not telling all these detailed stories that the others were worried about. So don't worry about those detailed stories. <laughs> uh, I was elected the 25th president in 1980. And in 1981, the um, uh, counterpart to this uh, convention today, uh, I was proud to have Melvin Belli come and address the group. And uh, it was a, a wonderful, wonderful seminar at that time. Uh, shortly after that, Jones against State Farm and Jim Butler took after the insurance companies. And Jim went around the, country, went around the state hosting seminars and giving away a book he had written on how to get these uh, damages or get, get your... Uh, 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 recovery up above this uh, original uninsured motorist or PIP coverage that we had. Jim speaking later this afternoon, he can tell us all about that. But the membership again almost doubled, almost doubled. And I appointed the first chair of the amicus committee. We didn't have an amicus committee until we'd been in existence 25 years. And once again, there were a lot of people that opposed the formation of that committee. Didn't think we should be telling the courts what to do that we ought to just look after our own little bailiwick and not get involved in the broader issue. Uh, I should tell you that you should have a history of law pack. And if you did write the pages of the history of law pack, even though I know y'all doubted my loyalty when we decided we'd be bipartisan, uh, I still have a little trouble with that, but I'm back giving my money to law pack again. But when we first started, three of us, or maybe it was four, paid a lady named Dodie Ellison, who I had gone to college with, to ride circuit throughout the state, getting lawyers to sign up for $25 a month or $5 a month on a checkoff basis. And that was the beginning of LawPAC. 
that, that long ago. And, and it was however little you'd, you'd give. And the truth is you can't give but $10 a month. I'm sure they got a way to take the check off for $10 a month. And don't think it's not important because that's $120 a year. But more importantly, it lets them have a budget and know what they're going to be doing. Uh, in 1984, uh, I was blessed to represent a family who had lost a little seven-year-old girl. And at that time, and a bunch of trucks came together and killed her, but the, at, at that time, the main significance of talking about this is that everybody thought that children were cheap, $50,000, $100,000. Nobody ever got any money for children because they didn't have any wage loss. They hadn't had established any earning capacity. And who'd want to make parents rich because they lost their precious little angel? Well. I tried to get in touch with Bob Shields. Bob Shields, I believe, got the first million dollar verdict in the state of Georgia. It was sometime after 1980. But, but, but think about it. We didn't have a million dollar verdict until the early 80s. And I got the second one for, for a little seven year old child and it was a million two hundred two hundred thousand dollars And they just couldn't believe it. We wouldn't have had that verdict if we hadn't had divorced parents who couldn't agree on anything much less settling the case. They each had a lawyer and the, the, they couldn't agree what lawyer to try it, so the two lawyers convinced them to let me come try it. So I was the compromised lawyer, you know, to try that case. I, I have to tell you that um, my friend Zach Dozier, who was one of those lawyers, when we were walking out and I had my chest all swelled out, you know, got this million dollar verdict, he said, well, Tommy, you could have done that a long time ago. I said, well, Zach, tell me, how could I have done it a long time ago? He said, just get another $4 million case. <laughs> And, and, you know, there's a lot of truth in that. You know, we want to talk about what we do. I think we are good to package it and present it. But those clients and those jurors, you know, are what really uh, determine this thing. Now, in 1987, the Georgia Trial Lawyers Association underwent a new beginning. And it brought a lot of new lifeblood and not a, new, a lot of new vigor and a lot of new leadership, you know, into the organization. And in 1988, Jim Butler was elected president, and we've really become a strong central organization for those who care about representing the, uh, the citizens of this state who've been run over by the rich and powerful. 1993, uh, the first African-American president was elected in 93, Charles Mathis. 1998, GTLA member Roy Barnes was elected governor the same year the Georgia Trial Lawyers Association elected their first female president. GTA, GTLA hired its first full-time director of public and political affairs in 2003, and that's when we established the champions. And it was really, I, I was there, and either I've, my memory's faulty, but I don't think so, it was $5,000 to be a champion. You had to give $2,500 to LawPAC, and you had to give $2,500 to the general uh, fund so that we could hire our political director. And Bill Clark was the first p political director. And without champions, we could not afford a political director. Gail Brown celebrated 20 years of service in 2004. And in 2006, GTLA celebrates its 50 years of collective strength through consumer rights. Now let me go back to those early days, starting in about 67, 68. There were about 100 members, maybe by the time I got in, 120, 125, before J.D. came and spoke, and for some years after that. But when you go from 100 members to 1,000 members, you, you lose the family, you know, unless you work real hard to keep that big family together. And I can remember, some memories are really fond, some other memories are a little hazy. Uh, remember this is pre-Debbie years. You know, so uh, those of you who have known me since, Debbie, you get a whole lot better, better Tommy than you did back in those days. But Judge Evans would, ha would have on Thursday night, he'd have all the leaders of the organization and anybody wanted to become a leader, all you had to do was show up on Thursday before the seminars started on Friday. And you would get to hear, John, how many times you reckon we heard Gudrun Mills and George Freihofer, uh, Sr., Saying, uh, saying Edelweiss. They always sing Edelweiss after a few drinks all of us had. And, and then Judge Evans, who was later recognized by Atla as being the outstanding uh, appellate judge of the year. But um, 
he would generally say, recite for us the same two poems. I'm not going to give you both of them. The, the, the one I'm not going to do is Tubes Are Twisted and Dried, and it was by Rudyard Kipling, and it has something to do with being old and that sort of thing. <laughs> but, but he would always say this, and he could recite it. I wish that I had had time or the ability to be able to recite it, but, but think about this as I share it with you. Because he did it every Thursday night before every meeting of the Georgia Trial Lawyers Association. An old man going a lone highway came at evening, cold and gray, to a chasm vast and deep and wide, through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. The southern sullen stream had no fears for him, but he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a pilgrim near, you're wasting strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never again must pass this way. You have crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build you the bridge at eventide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend, in the path that I have come, he said, thou followeth after me today. A youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm that has been naught for me, to that fair-haired youth may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I am building this bridge for him. And that's what keeps me going back to work every day, what ke keeps J.D. Lee in the uh, thick of things. And, and I really should have told you earlier, J.D. can't stay with us tonight because he's going back to run a marathon. A marathon. J.D., how old are you? Not, not, not the one you calculate, the one according to your birth certificate. I think 81 in two weeks. 81 in two weeks. Still, still trying cases, still giving back. He's, he's one, of the, one of the lead tobacco lawyers. He didn't make all the billions of dollars some of the Johnny-come-latelys made, but he's been in the trenches since the beginning, and now it's kind of come full circle for him because they're trying these individual cases. But take the example you've got with J.D. Lee. What, what, what giving back that I'm able to do? And just understand we are a family, and we have been entrusted with the safety and the future of those who will predictably be injured by the carelessness of others. The fight is not ended. The fight has truly begun. Thank you, Mr. President.